Welcome to the Seahawks Man to Man podcast, powered by Blue Wire. Shout out to the new company. My name is Michael Sean Dugar. You guys can follow me on whatever Elon Musk is calling that app these days. Uh, you guys know my at name, it has not changed. M I K E D U G A R. I appreciate all the love and support from everyone who's either watching or listening on our YouTube channel. Seahawks Man to Man is the name of the channel. That's Seahawks Man, the number two man. Thank you, thank you, and appreciate all the love and support on there for all our audio people. Just pause it real quick, shoot right over to YouTube, and hit subscribe, hit like, and then just come right back. That's all. Even if you're an audio person, we just appreciate um, all that love. It really helps us out, keeps the podcast growing and everything. So thank you, thank you. Chris, go ahead, talk to him. What is going on, everybody? It's your boy, Christopher Kidd. You can follow me on Twitter at CKIDD206, and that's CKID206. And to echo what Mike is saying, yes, please hop over on the YouTube channel. We got some really cool stuff going on with our draft previews. We actually have video footage of some of these athletes that we have talked about. So if you're listening and have listened and you're thinking, huh, I guess I'm curious as to what some of these guys look like on the field, we have it for you. So there's another reason to go check us out on YouTube because we do have some visual, despite just staring at us for however long we do the pod. So please, yeah, go over and subscribe to Seahawks Man to Man on YouTube. I mean, if you want to stare at us, that's fine too. I mean, that's why I, you know, spend this money on these paintings that are in the in the in the back of my shot. Well, I, actually, I didn't buy. I got Nipsey, Nipsey in future. There's a Martin Luther King behind me as well. I got a Dodge. That was actually a gift. Shout out to the homie Zay. Graduation gift uh, from Waz- when I graduated from Wazoo. Also, I'm old, Chris. I just realized uh, my 10 year anniversary from college uh, is next month. I was looking. I don't at even want to think year. about. I was watching something and it was, I was watching Insecure and it was uh, going to their 10 year reunion from Stanford. And I was like, oh, my 10 year might be coming up. And I was like, oh, it's next month. And I'm old. Uh, oh. yeah, class of 2014. Yeah, man. I'm in two years. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it, it, when it hits, wow. it'll be like, oh, that was, yeah, I feel, I feel really How long? We didn't, we didn't get a, I don't know if you guys did, but we didn't, uh, we didn't get a 10 year high school reunion because of COVID. I know we're the same class so no we did schools but no I, yeah. I, i'm right there with you we had a we had it all planned out obviously i'm sure you guys probably had talks as well and then the world ended for a few for a year and some changes <laughs> so we did yeah, not have our senior and we were going to combine ours with the 2011 class and i think covid prevented that too and then by then it was 2022 and uh, everybody no from point. my class was like it's yeah it's good we know where to find y'all if we want to kick it <laughs> <laughs> we'll all meet up at the bar or something like that if we really want to lock in with the people we graduated with. Uh, so anyway, yeah, that's a random revelation I had this week. Uh, the draft is almost upon us. We are in the same month as the draft now. That's how you know uh, it's real. Also, the homie Dane Brugler's Beast is coming out, I believe, this week too. So that's also how you know it's draft season. I, I don't have a firm date on that, but I was told it's this week because they asked me to do another mock draft. And I'm like, yo, I need Dane. <laughs> Like, <laughs> I, can't, I, just, I can't keep just like doing this without Dane. Like, I don't, especially a seven round mock. It's like, bro, I don't know the linebackers to pick in the sixth round. Where Dane at? <laughs> you know, and I can't just sit on the phone with him and do it. You know, do the mocks. I'm like, all right, when's the beast coming? So it should be coming out uh, this week. And when that comes, it's just full on, full on game changer. Uh, but before that, though, um, you guys uh, had a lot of questions about the draft. I, I put out a, a call for some pre draft questions about the Seahawks, the season. You guys delivered, as you guys always do. Great questions, funny questions. A couple that uh, we're not answering, um, but we're <laughs> funny and we and we saw them. Uh, so let's uh, let, let's hop right into the stuff you guys want to know about pre-draft we'll start, bag. Let's do it. Let's start with Alec. And off the bat, do you think John's draft strategy will change much with the new staff? Yeah, I feel like Chris, and I don't really know when this happened. But I feel like when Pete got fired, it was this like general kind of feeling among the fan base. At least like I would say a good half of the fan base that was like, great. 
we're going to spend money in free agency now and we're going to draft differently. And I'm like, wait, where have you guys been for the past 14 years? John is in charge of the roster. Yes, Pete Carroll has final say, but that's more like a contractual thing to save Pete's butt if he, so John doesn't do something really crazy that gets him fired. That's what that really, you know, in effect sounds like. But for the most part, they in there together working on stuff. They, they're the last two people that are in there, you know, when they do their draft board. I believe, actually, as it trickles down, so like let's say the draft is on Thursday. Monday, there's people in there. And I think by Tuesday, it's just Pete and John in the draft room. And then by Wednesday, I'm pretty sure it's just John, right? And, and then, you know, they have the draft the next day. So that kind of shows you how things are going. It's not necessarily – Pete's like, Johnny, I need you to draft this guy. I need you to draft that guy. Uh, I need you to pay whatever it costs to keep Will Disley. Go ahead and do it. It's like, no, that's that's, that's not how it works. Or it's like, oh, no, John, I don't want to pay Shaquille Griffin. Let him go. You know, so John just does it. John's not a puppet. He never has been a puppet. They've always been working in tandem, you know. So if you're upset about roster construction over the last, I don't know, five, six, seven years, you know, post-Legion of Boom, you got to be mad at both dudes. They're equally... Uh, is culpable? Is that the word I want to use here? Remind me to look say, up culpable. You know what? Dumb it down. Equally yoked. Well, no, well, <laughs> no I, I want to use, I want to try to say blame. I think that's what culpable means. I got to look that up while we're going. But the point is, I've always linked them together. I know that there are certain parts of the overall machine that are different. Like, obviously, John has more say over personnel and draft picks. And then Pete obviously is the coach. So the on-field product is far more a reflection of Pete than it is John, but they're, they're, they're together in this. So if you didn't like the D Eskridge pick, the guy who made the D Eskridge pick is still calling the shots. If you love the 2012 draft, the guy who called the shots there is still here. If you loved them taking Tyler and Frank in 2015, but hated them taking, uh, LJ Collier and Marquise Blair in 2019. Well, hey, John's guys are still here. It's the same guys. Same guys that did the good, same guys that did the bad. Of course, there's going to be some input from the coach. That's the case now. You think Mike McDonald and Mike McDonald's like, yeah, no, John, I really need some, uh, I need some like undersized kind of athletic interior linemen because I really want to get out on the perimeter. I want to move. And then John just takes a bunch of fat guys who just who are good in like gap schemes. No. No, he's going to get input from the coaches. That's just how this has always worked. It's how literally every spot works. I'm pre Chris, who are the people? There's some people around the league who's the head coach has like final say. I think Andy Reid might be one. Um, Ron Rivera was another. I think the guy who was the really bad coach in the Panthers recently. Um, oh, shoot. He's like the coach in Nebraska now. Uh, Matt Rule. Matt Rule, pretty yeah. Sure, I'm pretty sure Matt Rule had final say over Scott Fitterer, who was the GM. Um, but go ask some Panthers fans about the what roster. About Mike Tomlin? Uh, I'm not sure if he has final say over their GM. I forget his, their GM's uh, name. Well, never but mind. I, I, You're, I get your point. I think everyone else yeah. does too. So, yeah. The, the point is that the the like go ask these other franchises, go both good and bad. You know, Chiefs fans when they got a roster issue. I, I, actually, I don't know if Brett Veach is under Randy Reid, but either way, the point is that the GM still is in charge, even if it's not final say. He's in charge. A lot of times what you'll see is John bringing something to Pete like, yo, hey, I, th I really think we should get this guy. And I think he can do this. He's really good at this. He didn't have an opportunity here. Um, I think we could use him here. He's like, oh, yeah, sounds good. Yeah, cool. You know, it's like he's not not a puppet. He has his own ideas. His John has his own philosophy, his own beliefs on roster construction, how to spend money, what positions to pay. And John's been telling us this stuff for years. Like he's been talking about how, how much he learned of the Ron Wolf. And what's that other guy from Green Bay he always talked about? Oh, Ted Thompson. Like, every time John talks, he talks about basically what he learned from the Packers. Or um, I think he worked with Marty Schottenheimer at least once. Um, he talks about this all the time. He's telling us his philosophy, what he feels about this position, that position, what kind of quarterbacks he likes. All of this stuff. He's been doing it. So to, to, the, to think that all of that changes because Pete's gone. That's just, that's just wild. And that goes with the, the money too. Like Pete don't negotiate contracts. He never has, you know, they, Matt Thomas and John Snyder will negotiate a contract. They'll pop in Pete's office and be like, yo, we got a, we, we kept Leonard Williams or not Leonard's a bad example, obviously, but, uh, oh, we kept up. We just paid Tyler Lockett, you know? Oh, we just secured the Dwayne Brown extension. Oh, we just got the Bobby deal done. He can practice now. Cause he was holding in, you know, like that's generally how I feel like, um, it goes like Pete's in charge. He's aware of what's going on, but like, you know, um, 
the Marshawn trade. That was Pete like every day being like, yo, John, can you go get Marshawn? And you're like, I don't know, man, you know, Buffalo playing hardball, blah, blah, you know, takes a little bit, you know, and then that finally came through. I think Jamal Adams was the same way. It's like, yo, can we get him? Can we get him? It's like, but it's, can we get him? You know, like, and if the answer is no, the answer is no. You know, think of all the people that they flirted with and we heard that they didn't sign, you know, a TJ Lang and Antonio Brown. Um, There's probably some other ones that I'm forgetting. But anyway, that's a long way in the way of saying, I think you will see, it'll be hard. It'll be nearly impossible, I think, to tell the differences in draft strategy with Pete as the coach versus Mike McDonald, just because it's still John and his, and his staff. They still do the research uh, they'll meet with the coaches, but they they have their own, they're, they're, that's what they're paid to do is manage the roster, is to scout these guys and do the research and 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 have the medicals right and project guys who maybe played corner but there's a safety at this level or played guard but now he's a tackle or played defensive tackle and now he's a guard like Jr. Sweezy like that's their scout their their their, uh, their staff's job, um, and sometimes you get an influential coach position coach like uh who's Tom Cable it was very influential for his position group, um, but in general it's John's show. You know, he was working in tandem with Pete. He's going to work in tandem with Mike McDonald. He's not. If Mike McDonald tells him, hey, man, if you draft a receiver, I really could use a slot guy. You know, they don't need that now. But let's say, you know, that's the mandate. John's not going to go draft a bunch of, you know, some big 6'3 X receivers. You know, if, if his coach is like, hey, our roster is really this is what we really need right now. You know, like it's it's a teamwork thing. So the draft strategy is going to be largely the same because the guy who's been doing the drafts. It's still here. He's still here, you know? So uh, I don't know if that's good or bad necessarily. They've had some funky drafts the last couple of years. Uh, the last two have been okay. But wh- whether good or bad, I would not expect drastic shift in philosophy because John just has his way of doing things. He has his way of valuing trades up or down. He has his way of valuing certain positions. You guys heard him uh, earlier this year on the radio. He was like, paying a guard? I ain't doing that overdrafting a guard you must be kidding me you know what i'm saying you know he doesn't is believe in that so and that's a his belief thing it's not pete brainwashing him so uh, yeah uh, i'm expecting largely a lot of the same process that led to the good drafts and the bad drafts as they go into what is arguably probably their most important draft since 20 2017 probably really important draft 18, here damn it okay 2018 right. was that a big one i can't remember if that was like super big was that i thought it was big just because they were in that that year where it was so that following that year and two after 2007 season 17 season obviously the legion of boom 2.0 didn't work out <laughs> with all those guys that they wanted to go out and get that's right that's right so that's right. they needed some they they really needed a bunch of guys and you know getting dk was huge obviously so that's a plus but no that's the 2019 draft Oh shoot! So I'm thinking of the right draft, but have the wrong guy in it. Lovely. Who was in that 2018 draft class, real quick? Well, the, two, the 2018 draft, a uh, little re- oh. rewind, is that the, they uh, they they didn't have a second round pick because of the Sheldon Richardson trade. They didn't have a third round pick because of the Dwayne Brown trade. So they went into it with pick 18, but they didn't pick again till the fourth. So they traded oh, out yeah, of pick that's, 18. That's, Penny, and, that's right. They took Penny. Now yeah, I remember. They, okay. they they had 18. They traded back nine spots with the Packers, who came up and got Jair Alexander. One pick after the Chargers, who I believe had Gus Bradley at the time, took Derwin James with pick 17. I would I always thought that, that they were they probably were going to take Derwin. And then when they didn't, and when the Chargers took him, it's like, ah oh, damn. All right, Green Bay, come on up. Took Jair, traded back nine spots, took Rashad. Um, and then didn't I didn't have a second round pick. They, they didn't have they a second didn't... or a third. Uh, no, they had a third. Of, I'm pretty sure it was Rasheen. They 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 didn't have a third going into the draft. Because of the okay. Dwayne Brown trade, they picked up that third in the Trading trade back. back. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So they didn't. They, so they had. They had. They had pick eighteen, but didn't. They weren't scheduled to pick again until pick fourteen or pick to the fourth round because of <laughs> Dwayne Brown and Sheldon Richardson. Uh, okay. And so that's why John was like, "I got to trade back. I need more capital." Picked up Rasheem, and I think they picked up Will Disley in that draft. Trey Flowers, Michael Dixon. Yes, uh, because Griffin. I got Will when we did our mock draft. We haven't done that again. Thank goodness. That was the one player that I got right. I got Will I Disley. Remember that. <laughs> so that That's was right. that was a hooray for me, and they also took Shaquille Griffin. Now I'm starting to remember Sha- that. Draft. Sha- Shaquem Griffin. Goodness, Shaquem gracious, in 2018, right. Shaquille yes. in 2017, and they also picked up Trey Flowers, who Trey we thought, Flowers, yep, yeah, that, yeah, that that was just a really rough draft class. That that was a, that was a pivotal that was a pivotal draft though too, uh, because like you said, Legion of Boom had just 
Um, they really had no one left. Earl was holding out, so he was still on the contract, but like Cam's situation was murky. Uh, Sh- uh, Sherm had just got cut. Cliff wasn't. Cliff was hurt. They traded Mike B. So they really needed to reload. So to not have draft capital to reload was tough. And then they needed a corner, but then traded out of the pick that became Jair Alexander. You know, so it's very, very tough. We can move on. But yeah, that was a that was a pivotal draft as well. I think 2017 was also just pivotal because if they wanted to get ahead of replacing the Legion of Boom, that was the year to do it. You know, yeah. that was the year to be one year ahead of replacing Cam, one year ahead of replacing Earl, one year ahead of replacing Sherm. Not to say they could actually do it, but if you wanted to try, that was now the year the to do it. And they bungled pretty much all of that with the exception of, like, the drafting of Shaquille Griffin. <laughs> well, this next one is from DC. If Sam Howell was in this year's draft, what number would he be ranked? And what round do you guess he's drafted? And so I would – so because – I think a team would probably reach on Sam because his numbers in college weren't that bad. He went in the fifth round of the commanders based on the quarterbacks in this class. I wouldn't be surprised if he went in the fourth round, which is not crazy to say. Obviously it's not like I said, Oh, he'd be a second round draft pick. I think he would definitely go in the fourth. He'd probably be ranked. Mm. I would say if you had to rank, the 10 quarterbacks in this class, he would fall somewhere maybe 9, 10 in that. Eh, maybe 7, 8, actually. I put him in 7, 8, but I definitely think instead of going in the fifth round, he would go in the fourth round. I think a team would definitely take a risk on him, especially looking at this class. There's, what, four really, like, we get these guys are going in the first round, obviously. And then after that, it's kind of, well, what would you like? And does this person fit? Are they going to be your future? And I think a team... I can't. Mm, I think for uh, maybe the Panthers would be desperate and take another quarterback, right? That would be crazy. That would be crazy. Well, they don't but got no draft capital. Well, that's why. Get him in the fourth, though. Well, uh, yeah, maybe. I mean, they did that. They did that when they drafted uh, what's that kid, Matt Corral. I think they drafted him. Oh yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah. That didn't pan out. I think they traded up for him too. Uh, that was yes, okay. They no no trading up, Mike. But if he's there, you know, fourth round, I see a team that is unsure about their future, just saying, screw it. We'll just take another quarterback because defensively, I think the Carolina Panthers are solid. Offensively, they just didn't have a quarterback. The quarterback they do have, they didn't take, if they do take Bryce Young and then they get another fourth round to select, I don't know, another position, maybe they say, you know what? Let's get another quarterback. Maybe that's crazy that's, thinking. That, that, that would be, that would be, yeah, that would, that would, that would get somebody fired, probably. Oh, okay, uh, everyone's getting fired. That's just one team that came to mind. Obviously, I can do more research and probably come up with a better team that could take him in the fourth round. But I would say Sam would likely go probably fourth round, and he's probably ranked seven eighth out of all the quarterbacks. He's definitely a day three guy if he's in this class. I think that the reason that trading for Sam might dissuade the Seahawks from drafting quarterback is because of the combination of experience, cost, and age. Sam was born in 2000. I'm going to talk about feeling old. Uh, I think he's like November 2000 or something. He's either September or November 2000, I think is his birthday. Um, so he's he's the same age as Michael Penix. He's the same age as Spencer Rattler, but he's already played 18 and if they started 18 games, I believe. Like that's a mm-hmm. lot of NFL experience to be the same age as guys who are just going to be, you know, wet behind the ears when they, when they come into the league, I think he's younger than Bo Nix Sam is. Right. So uh, you got a guy who is younger than at least one prospect, the same age as most of the other prospects. I believe he's the same age as J- Jaden Daniels as well. So I think that's the, that's where he's attracted to Seattle, not necessarily because he's better than Michael Penix. I don't think so. I think Penix is going to be a better pro than, than Sam Howell. You know, I think even like Bo Nix could be a better pro. Um, I think Jaden Daniels, I think all these guys have the potential, JJ McCarthy as well. I think the what makes Sam attractive is the is the experience already. Because let's say they didn't have Sam and they go in here and they take and they take a Bo Nix or something like that at some point. It doesn't really matter where they take him. Yeah, okay, something happens to Gino. Gino rolls his ankle, you know, knee gets bent back, same freak stuff that happened last year, right? And then you got this guy who ain't never never been in that moment. You know, there's just something to be said for experience. Drew had obviously a lot more experience. Actually, not a ton more. I think he only had 20-something starts um, when he uh, came in last year to be the starter for a little bit. But look at the first situation Drew was thrown in. On the road, on Monday Mm -hmm. Night Football, early in the season, and he was ready. Now, he played super great, but he was ready. 
You know, he, he calmed down after like two plays and was, and was locked in. It's just a lot easier to do when you've already played in the NFL before. You know, so if you're Seattle, even if you don't think Sam is great, he's just seen a lot of concepts. He's played a lot. He's played. A, that's a lot of snaps he's seen, particularly passing the ball. I think he threw it. He had 700 dropbacks last year. So that's where the that's where the advantage is for Seattle. I don't I know that wasn't the exact question, but it's kind of what I wanted to get to with with that. Because, yeah, Sam in this draft would probably be fourth or fifth round again. Day three guy. But why he's so valuable in Seattle's eyes is, yo, we can get a dude who's played a thousand snaps in the league already, and he the same age as Michael Penix, uh, and he ain't costing us nothing. He costs the same as like Kobe Bryant or something like that, you know, for the for the next two seasons. That's huge. That's huge. Uh, I think Sam might cost the same as Tariq. They're both fifth round picks in the same draft. So, um, yeah, I think I think Tariq might have been drafted after him. Anyway. That that's the the value that they see. Whether right or wrong, I don't know. I'm John seems to be John seems to overlook interceptions in a way that I just don't with quarterbacks. You know, because um, it's it's every quarterback throws picks, but like John doesn't care if you throw them in abundance, and that really bothers me. You know, um, like Gino threw them a lot uh, in, in New York. Drew threw them a lot in Denver, uh, and Sam throwing them a lot in Washington and the white I know, Winston. <laughs> yeah it's, it's, you know honestly it's funny it's so surprising that they've it doesn't seem that they've had serious interest in Jameis because he has some of these same qualities you know really <laughs> really big arm uh like really strong in the pocket guy not super athletic so maybe that's why because Jameis is not athletic he's just black he's not athletic at all um <laughs> he's just got a strong arm uh and he he just throws it all over the yard but yeah John's just like so who cares if you led the league in interceptions I like you're a gamer kid. Come over here. And I'm just like, I don't, I don't view quarterbacks that way. I I, I just don't, I, I like them to be a little bit more um, conservative uh, with, with the football, you know, uh, if you can, because yeah, leading the league in interceptions, we're never going to win anything with that. I know John spent time around Brett Favre, but it's like, bro, this is not that, this is not that. I don't think Brett led the league in interceptions, any of those MVP years. Right. So um, you got to protect the ball at some point. Anyway, we can go to the, to the next question. No, I feel you on that. That's a, hilarious point that you made because you know you could have just taken Jameis Winston and been fine <laughs> he, he's yeah. seen the game too he's well he's it's, it's got to be it's got to be mutual maybe Jameis didn't want to come here you know he's yeah, been in yeah, contract yeah. with New Orleans for a little bit so it you know it's got to be mutual interest but yeah I'm, I'm, I'm surprised we haven't at least seen the Seahawks linked to Jameis more you know, <laughs> with some reports and some rumors or something because it's like oh you threw 30 picks Come on over, kid. I feel like that's what John John is like likes them guys who just be just throwing it to the other team. Jameis threw like six pick sixes in 2019. <laughs> Nuts. Like, bro, what? But you know what's crazy? Record. He didn't throw one against the Seahawks. The Seahawks. That <laughs> that's what that's like a perfect John guy. You you threw the ball to the other team all season, and then you play the Seahawks. Oh, and you ball out. So that game went to overtime. I think Russ had threw a game winner to Jacob Hollister. So Jameis played well in that game. I think he fumbled, but didn't throw a pick. I can. I'm very surprised John wasn't like, "Yeah, sign me up, Mr. <laughs> Winston." I don't know. Uh, he, he definitely should have. We got Gone Guy here. Do you think Mike McDonald and Ryan Grubb's recent experience at the college level give the Seahawks an advantage in the draft? Uh, that's a good question, um, and because. You know, Pete had that experience. You know, the difference is, for one, Pete coached in college a lot longer. I think Pete got to USC, what, 2001 or something. So he had a lot of time and basically spent the 2000s scouting, you know, and re recruiting, and like, you know, studying college guys. So he had a much longer advantage there. I think Mike McDonald spent one year at Michigan. So that's uh, there's the obvious difference right there you know recruited some kids but you know and obviously watched them on film there's that advantage but i think there's a difference between doing that for a year versus pete doing it for the better part of a decade right so i, I think there's the difference there um the other difference is pete had guys with him that did that uh pete brought guys with him from usc uh i know i think canals the U, uh, usc guy tater is a usc guy he brought a bunch uh with him people who were with him at usc he brought him with him i can't remember everybody off the top of my head but so it wasn't just Pete's eye that he brought with him, you know, familiar with the college game. I know Mike McDonald has Grubb too, but here, Chris, we can look this up in real time. How long did Ryan Grubb even coach like Two major years. college football? I know he was at he was at the Huskies for a little bit, wasn't he? At like Fresno State for a little bit. So, so I think yeah, six years maybe. He he was the South Dakota State running backs coach in 05. That's like his intro job to college football. So he's at South Dakota State, 
Sioux Falls, Eastern Michigan, Fresno, 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 then, you know, Washington. So he has some, you know, experience, but uh, not really at the highest of the level like Pete did. Like Pete was recruiting the best kids, the kids who were the most likely to go to the league, too. Like, I don't know the type of kids that Ryan was probably looking at. Scott Huff, too, is a line coach, probably in the same boat. Uh, I don't know how many kids that they were maybe looking at to go to Sioux Falls uh, were the type of kids that will you know, make it to the league. You know, like Pete was over there scouting dudes, like trying to get, um, I don't know, like he was trying to get like a Pac-Man or Adrian Peterson. Like, I don't know if he's trying to get those guys in particular, but you guys get the gist. He was trying to get the good kids, the NFL kids, you know, uh, I think that's just a different bag. So that's, there's the other difference uh, there. I feel like is the time spent in the type of kids that uh, you're trying to recruit there. Uh, I do think there's a little bit of advantage. Here's where the advantage is. Probably not in the draft as much. Like in this draft, I do think they have a little bit because you got a bunch of kids from Michigan and a bunch of kids from Washington and then a bunch of kids from the Pac-12 and the Big Ten in general. Like that part, I do think Hills. I think Pete had like a, a, a more depth of knowledge because he had he had done it so much um, and for so long and was like recruiting at the highest level. But you know what's, what, make, what I think about with their advantage – in college, uh, particularly with Grubb and Huff, not much Mike McDonald, because uh, he hasn't even been coaching that long. Kids our age, or Mike McDonald's our age. Like uh, we're, t- I'm t- me and Chris turned thirty two in July. Mike McDonald's what thirty six. Yeah, we all the same. You know what I'm saying? We all watch us and Mike McDonald was watching the same cartoons growing up and everything. Like had the same theme birthday parties. You know, like he's not a '90s baby like us, but he's he right there. He's right there. <laughs> uh, yeah. Put it this way: I have close friends Mike McDonald's age, right? Like. <laughs> Like close, like, like close. This, I'm getting married in June. There's gonna be people in my wedding, Mike McDonald's age, who are like my homies. <laughs> so, it ain't, 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 ain't that far off. He he, right there with us. But I do think with Grubb and Huff, if you if you notice, uh, a, what a lot of pro coaches have done, and they've been doing this for years, is they'll go to the high school levels, the clinics or whatever. They'll go to college levels and they'll steal stuff. They'll steal ideas and plays. And you know, Andy Reid has done it. Bill Belichick has done it. Uh, I just saw a clip. It's not the exact same, but like on LeBron's podcast, he was talking about how their coach, after they lost the finals, went you know hung out with Chip Kelly and was like stealing ideas. And I said to say that, mm-hmm. yeah, um, the college program is really because there's so many schools doing so much different stuff, right? There was that one guy in that one school who like didn't kick ever, you know, uh, Mike's time. You know, that, was, that was crazy. He got fired fast at that new job too. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he got fired so fast. I forget his name in the school and logistics doesn't, it's not even worth looking up. But the point is that college, there's a lot of stuff to steal there. A lot of coaches who are doing some stuff, they have this adjustment to this coverage or this plan or this way of coaching the O-line. And a lot of that stuff eventually trickles up to the pro level. Um, like ideas get stolen and, and, and implemented. And Grubb and, and, um, and Huff are just coming straight from that. You know, even the special teams cat, uh, Jay Harbaugh, he's coming straight from that uh, too. So, I feel like that part, it may be their advantage. Whereas um, let's say you're a coach on the 49ers staff and you're going through like college film, maybe this summer right now, or this spring right now, you're looking for some advantage with like, I don't know, some type of you know concept to beat quarters, you know, like, and you got to go dig and deep. And maybe Ryan Grubb's like, oh, I remember we had this play once against Arizona a couple years ago and blah, blah, blah. And this is how we did this against, you know, it's just already there. Whereas, other guys may have to go look for it because they've been in the league, you know, for the last 10 years. Some, you know, just little small things like that. But I don't think it's going to be super, uh, as particularly with Mike McDonald, just because he didn't coach in college that long. I don't think it's going to be the same type of advantage we saw with like Pete or that even someone like Jim Harbaugh is going to have at the Chargers. I think he will have the advantage because he coached in college so long um, and probably has all the connections and stuff. I think we're going to see Jim have the same advantage that Pete had coming in in 2010. DK is a Wookie. Can you see any big <laughs> trades slash cuts prior to the draft to get the Seahawks cap compliant? I believe they're compliant um, already. Also, hold on. Can we? I just want to back check real quick because Chris, this will be kind of funny because um, I believe he's from Seattle. Uh, I was uh, working on something and Pete, you know, he had his first draft. I was watching some interviews from his first draft. And mm-hmm. he, when he when they took Earl. He got like, you know how they do those NFL network interviews the day of the draft, you know, yep. uh, he got like three or four questions about like why he didn't take Taylor Mays, you know, um, Taylor Mays. He's, yeah. He's O'Day guy, right? Taylor sure. Mays. As I actually, when I was in sixth grade or fifth grade at St. Therese, 
you know, when they bring high school students to come to your middle school to explain why you should choose said high school. Yeah. yeah. Taylor Mays came to the middle school, came to our middle school and gave a little speech. And I said, I'm going to O'Day. So shout out Taylor Mays. If you ever okay. Yeah. So Taylor Mays was one of the big reasons why I was like, I want to go to O'Day. But go and ahead, think, Mike. Back to and Taylor Taylor played for Pete. Um, yep. USC. Uh, at, at, at USC. Um, mm-hmm. But and, and Pete, looking back at this interview, it's so funny now. I was watching it like a couple weeks ago. But like Pete was trying real nice to NFL Network to be like, yeah, I love Taylor, but Earl is better. <laughs> That's pretty much <laughs> what, it, what he was trying to say. So I think Taylor either tweeted something or said something on draft night where he was like expressed frustration that Pete didn't take him. Right. You needed a safety. You know me. Why not take me? Like Taylor expressed some frustration, and Pete was on on TV. Like, yeah, no, nah, I love Taylor, but like Earl Thomas. <laughs> yeah. And at the time, it was like kind of controversial, though. That I forget who was interviewing him. That was like, yeah, Taylor Mays, Taylor Mays, Taylor Mays. Uh, but I bring that up back to spin that back to our question about coaches having knowledge of the players um, that they you know because they coached in college. That can make them not want a player too. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it's not just like oh, go grab guys I already know like. Pete knew Taylor Mays in and out and was like, see that kid at Texas? <laughs> Let's take him. And I'm unapologetically going to take him ahead of uh, Taylor. So, I, so that just made me uh, think of that. And Taylor being a Seattle guy, I didn't want to uh, spin that back. But the question about do I see a big trade? Um, Chris, I feel like we floated this last week when we were talking, uh, not, not on this pod, but somewhere else. And I really don't think there's a lot of trade opportunity on this roster if the Seahawks want to recoup a pick. I really just think it's DK. I think that's it. And I wouldn't do that. But, like, well, I forget what example I used last time, but I'll use another one. You know, that you, you, you're you uh, – who needs a receiver right now? The, the Bears? Who else needs a receiver? Who's going to take a receiver? Mm, Chargers? The Cardinals? Yeah, the Cardinals. No, you probably won't do a trade with, within the division in this instance. So let's, let's scratch the, the Cardinals. Okay. But let's – or even the Giants, right? So we got Giants, Chargers, and Bears, right? You call you call the Bears. You say, hey, we will give you DK Metcalf. Give us pick nine. They will you sign. <laughs> yeah, probably. Probably. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe they think that DK at that price tag and that age is not as valuable as Roma Dunze or something. You know, whatever. They got to do that math. But I feel like that's the only logical thing, unless you want to really punt on a rookie contract guy. And I just don't see that as being a smart thing. Like you call, you call uh, the Raiders with pick. Well, they need a quarterback, so maybe not them. You call the Broncos or something like that, uh, or maybe even you call who's got Washington. Washington has a, a ton of picks in the first one hundred. You call them and you say, "Hey, we know you just traded Montez Sweat. We know you just traded Chase Young. How about you cough up a second round pick and we'll give you Boy Mafe?" You know, I just don't like. Yeah, that's like a the type of trades you discuss, I just, I just don't see it. Otherwise I feel like you're, you're parting with like a veteran on an expensive deal. And Chris, I mean, you're seeing this teams are getting rid of their veteran dudes. And they're not even getting picks in this draft. Like yeah, Legereus Sneed. Yeah. Legereus Sneed next year. Um, who was the other Stephon one? That was a big Diggs? One. Stephon was Diggs a, a pick in 2025. There was another uh, trade too, where the, the, the compensation was a pick in 2025. It wasn't Keenan Allen. That was a fourth rounder this year. But it was another veteran like that where the team got a pick in like next year's draft. So that just shows you how teams are feeling about the veterans when you try to move them. Like if the Seahawks called and say, like, hey, who wants Tyler Lockett? Teams are going to be like, would you like a pick in 2029, John? <laughs> yeah, second round pick in 2030. How do you feel about that? You know, they're not getting anything of value. It's much more valuable to just have Tyler uh, on the roster. So I say that's a long winded way of saying, yeah, I'm not really – I, I, I don't I don't see it. The big one is yeah a, a DK or um, I mean you could trade like Reek, you know uh, Reek Boye. Um, am I missing somebody? Somebody else that you can part with? Yeah, I mean that would be bad because you just paid Chenna, so you're probably eating a lot of dead money on that. But yeah, Chenna. Um, and see, none of these just make sense. I feel like they probably if they were if John is people probably sat in the office and was like, hmm, how can we recruit a second round pick? Let's look at the roster. That combo probably lasted like two minutes. They probably <laughs> did the same exercise we just did and moved on, you know. So I, I I don't I don't see it. They just don't have a natural horse person to fork over that's gonna net something, you know. Um, like I said, you could if you wanted to get rid of Tyler, you're gonna call a team and they're gonna offer you a pick, you know, in 2045. What am I gonna do with that? You'll be fired mm-hmm. by then. Uh, yeah, so 
No, I, I don't see it. Bam season. Should the Seahawks prioritize offensive line, D line in the first few rounds? I'm looking up the word culpable. I forgot to do that. <laughs> yeah, deserving of blame. Yes, I used that correctly earlier. Sorry. Um, yeah, man. Offensive line, man. I just Chris, when I uh, you know, this project I'm working on, it's like I'm just like football junkie these days i'm watching old clips and you guys can probably see on my twitter too i'm like tweeting random games from like 2015 because i'm re-watching like a bunch of old stuff not just seahawks but a bunch of old stuff um and then i, I also will have like nfl network on on my tv too so like i'm watching present games on my tv old games on my phone while working on my laptop and it's there's just this just common denominator with the exception of like i would say the 2021 um bangles with the exception of them, the teams that are like real deal for real, it's the O-line, man. Because you can just do whatever you want when your O-line is good. You can get out in the perimeter. You can run it up the middle. You can be a good screen team. Y'all know I don't really get down with the screens. But you can do it if you got the right O-line. You can just do whatever the hell you want. You can be complex. Or, and this is something I uh, watching the 2022 Eagles, they were really simple. They did a lot of just the same stuff, but they just did it at such a high level because their old line was so damn dominant that they only they only had to run like a few things. But you couldn't, you know, you couldn't get around uh, Lane Johnson. You couldn't get around Kelsey. You couldn't get around. Uh, they got a couple dudes with like Polynesian sounding last names. But anyway, couldn't get around none of them up front. So yeah, I think Chris, I feel like we've joked in the past that one of these days Snatter was just going to what draft like all entire offensive linemen, like seven picks, and it's all linemen. Could be this year. Like, it's like, hey, we draft seven linemen and three of them hit. You just drafted three starters. You know, yeah. uh, now you didn't get nothing else. Uh, but yeah, I, I think you, I always would prioritize um, that. I would prioritize that because you just want to be so efficient. Um, I mean, there's a really good argument for D line too, but I feel like in this draft, yeah, man, load up on the load up on linemen, try to get as many big boys who are maulers as you can because it is just, it's just so ironic that John said that what he said about guards being overpaid and overdrafted the same year that Aaron Donald retires. And then you just go look at Aaron Donald's highlights that everyone's posting right now. And it's just Aaron Donald whooping every Seahawks interior lineman's butt. Dog. Every, yeah. every, every other clip, every other clip from the beginning, he was doing it when it was in St. Louis and he's, <laughs> he did it like, for really there's clips of Aaron Donald whipping butt in St. Louis at the Coliseum in, in LA at the, at the SoFi in Inglewood, wherever Aaron Donald plays the Seahawks, he is tossing interior linemen. So it's like, John, maybe you should, maybe you should try a different strategy because your strategy gets you on Aaron Donald's highlight reel. And <laughs> you, you just, you just don't want that, man. Aaron Donald broke the Seahawks, dog. He, he got everybody. He got people fired in 2020 because they played him three times in nine weeks. He broke Russ's finger. That ended the season. And <laughs> ended, yeah. That 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 the ripple effects of Russ's finger breaking were just abundant. So, uh, yeah, you gotta go. If you give me a choice, if there's like a really good offensive lineman and a really good defensive lineman on the board, and they're about the same type of player, yeah, go ahead, give me that lineman, dog. And we go. We're gonna try to not be on Aaron Donald's highlight reel ever again. Well, here we go. This is from Jimmy underscore Lee one. If Michael Penix and Troy Fatanu are there at 16, speaking of old linemen and a quarterback, is there any chance they'd pass on both? Chris, do you buy the Penix love? I, I, I see it. I understand. I personally would, if I were the, so we've talked about this, I think maybe our last show, I might've briefly mentioned it, but the big issue is, John is really big on having available picks in certain areas of the draft. I do not foresee John taking a player. If Troy or Michael is indeed there, I just can't see him saying, yeah, I'm going to take one of these two guys and then sit for an entire second round, get nobody, and then in the third round have an 81st pick. So that's 16 to 81. I just can't see John doing that. And the Seahawks, as a team, they don't have a bunch of things figured out where John could actually, you know what, this is the year where I can sit and wait because I know if I get my guy at 16, I'm good everywhere else on the roster. I can find some gold. He doesn't have that option this year. So unfortunately, 
I think he would have to pass because there's so many glaring holes that he needs to fix. But this is me speaking from John, and this is me speaking as if John wants to win a Super Bowl next year. Obviously, they want to win. He didn't come out and say, I want to win a Super Bowl next season. Because if he says that, that changes everything to me in my eyes. That says, I mean, he does, for what it's worth. He, he does. Okay. You can read I, between the yeah, teeth. He, you can he, read yeah, between no, the teeth. I don't even got to read, but I, I, I know that that is what John, that is what John, that's what John wants. But on paper and how this team and this roster looks, it's not, it's not in stone. They're not a contender right now. I don't see the Seahawks as a contender. Correct. They're not even the second best team in the division. I think the Rams are better than them right now, even though they just lost Aaron Donald, which is an mm-hmm. argument that can be had. The biggest point I'm trying to make is that I think there's just too many holes for the Seahawks to say, yeah, we'll take one of the best players at 16 and then wait until the 81st pick and get another guy. I think they're going to have to move back, maybe get somewhere in the mid-20s to even get a second rounder, which would be, what, maybe 50, 50, 60s, somewhere around there, potentially. And that is something I foresee happening. I really don't see John taking a risk and taking someone at 16, whether it is Troy or Michael Penix. And with Michael Penix, it makes sense, but you also have Sam Howell. So now what? The future is going to be Sam Howell versus Michael Penix. Uh, I'd rather, I I'd honestly, it'd be tough for me to say that the Seahawks would draft him, but I also see why they wouldn't. But I I just can't see some them thinking a player is going to be that great that they're willing to wait, you know, 81 minus 16. You do the math, Mike. You don't want to do math on this show. I ain't doing that. Over 60 picks to get their next guy. I just don't see that as smart. And I don't think John's willing to take a risk that big, especially when he wants to win a Super Bowl next season. Yeah, I think taking Penix would be crazy at that. And it, I really, I really do think it would be, I think it would be crazy. Um, unless you plan on getting rid of Gino. That's the only way. And if you want, that's a totally different argument if you would, if, if that's part of it. But if the argument is, let's take Penix. So we have Penix, Sam Howell, and <laughs> Gino Smith. That's, that's just a crazy allocation of resources to the quarterback position when your quarterback ain't even that bad. You know, that's like not it's, just, it's just really yeah. not. Yeah. You just, cause then like you said, Chris, you didn't fix anything within the first 80 picks. All you did was take a backup quarterback. Again, this is presuming that you're going to keep Gino. Now, if you're going to like, Oh, he took Penix. So we'll just, you know, ship Gino to Bermuda or something like that. Okay. Then that's different, but I wouldn't do that either. But if you get Gino up out of there because you think Penix is the guy, that's a different thing. But then I'll wonder why you restructure Gino's deal, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I think that would be crazy. Even though I I, I like the guy, uh, he he's moving a lot better than I than I thought. You know, when when I watched him in these games, like even him straight line speed doesn't really matter to me for a quarterback. But his forty was like interesting. I was like, oh okay, yeah, he do he, he ran a black guy time, good for him. Um, it was a really fast forty time that Mike Penix ran. But yeah, I, I think that would be crazy. Um, if you three, what do you need three quarterbacks for? And look at what they did to get Sam. They moved back out of the third round. That would just be so much dedicated between the money on Gino, basically moving back, moving out of day two to get Sam Howell, and then using your day one pick. Oh, yeah, that's tough. Yeah, I think that would be crazy just in terms of resource allocation, not even talent, just resource allocation. That would be just nuts. Um, and with the other guy, Troy, uh, I could I could see them taking Troy. I probably I don't know if I could do that for the same reason that you said. I just feel like we, we need more we need more swings. We need more swings at the plate. We need more bites of the apple, whatever phrase you want to use. I feel like the, the cupboard is too bare. The roster needs too much young talent, you know, not only for this year, but for next year and future seasons. So yeah, I, I could see I could see John taking Fontenot or another lineman, you know, with that first pick, but a quarterback, Fontenot? that's that's great. I, however you say bro name, don't really matter. They know who we're talking about. Um if they draft him, we'll correct it. Uh but in the meantime, taking Penix just seems any quarterback, not just Penix, but taking a taking a quarterback at sixteen just sounds so crazy right now. Moving on, this is from Nick Z Red. In the past, Seattle took several path path rushers. Wow, I was coming out really smooth <laughs> here. Pass rushers with top fifty picks: Daryl Taylor, Boy Mafi, Boy Mafe. Wow, I'm just screwing up names today. And Hall, but never were put on the field consistently enough truly show what they had i don't know about that one do you think the new regime will get some of these guys more involved than the previous one so with tarot 
God dang, man, what is going on with me? With Taylor, Mafe, and Hall, I don't think they – I know Taylor, Taylor got a lot of opportunities. He, he just – he was inconsistent, unfortunately. Mafe, he had a really hot start and then cooled off. And then Hall, he also just hasn't really impacted the game, I think, the way the Seahawks wanted him to. And I don't know how many times you're going to put a guy out there that's not, I guess, doing his job. There's only so many times you can say, yeah, keep going out there. We had this conversation with KJ. And it was basically, obviously, these dudes were not the first-round pick. or Yeah, they weren't a first-round pick. I know Taylor was second-round. Mafe, I forget where he was, but I think it was a third they're, or fourth. They're all, sec- they're all second round. Second, so, yeah, all second-round picks. The biggest the conversation we had with KJ was, in this scenario, you drafted a guy in the first round, 13th overall. He is not getting it done. Do you bench him? And I said, yes, <laughs> because we're not getting better. There's, he's not helping this team. Maybe putting him on the sideline and learning and realizing his negative impact is going to change some things and we can get him to figure it out. But putting him out there and he's not getting the job done, I know you put all your, you know, your resources towards him to get it done. You're paying this man, you know, paying him a lot of money, but it's not working out. So at what point in time do you say, yeah, we can't rely on this guy? I think same discussion falls in with Taylor, Moffat, and Hall. Taylor was not being consistent enough. They tried over and over again to figure out ways to get him to the quarterback, and it just didn't work out. So I don't know if the words, they never put those guys in specific scenarios to get enough chances, because I know Taylor has had a bunch. Boy, Moffat, again, he's played pretty well. I think Hall is the only guy in this scenario that really hasn't been seeing the same snap counts, but I think it's because of the product that he's putting, putting on the field. He's not impacting the game the way they thought he should. And I don't know how long you're going to continue to try it before you realize, yeah, we can't continue to do this before we put someone else in or we draft another young guy. Yeah, I think for edge rushers, what happens on first and second down is really important. You know, it's a reactionary position in a lot of ways. Uh, I mean, defense in general is pretty reactionary. But like on first and second down, there's so much going on with the run fits and the schemes these days with all the motion and everything. And if if you're just really strong and athletic or fast or whatever and explosive, that's cool. But you got to be able to channel that and use it appropriately. I remember us talking about this when they drafted Jordan Brooks. Yeah, faster than KJ, faster than Bobby. But speed, if you don't know where that speed's supposed to be going, well, then you're a rookie Earl Thomas just giving up big plays all over the place. And to your point about a high draft pick not getting it done, they almost benched Earl as a rookie because Earl was getting looked off by quarterbacks and he was biting on pump fakes. He was giving up big plays, you know? Um, Pete was almost like, dude, I almost got to sit you down because you are bugging, right? Even though he was the 14th pick. Um, So I I say that with the edge rushers because it's important. Yeah, if you're an edge rusher, but really first and second down is really how you become – an impactful player at that spot, which is why, to your point about inconsistency, we haven't seen DT have that same impact because he's not the the reliable run defender. Um, and with D Hall, it was the same way. It's like things are happening so fast right there, and you don't have time to process because you're right there on the line. So if your eyes are in the wrong space or whatever, it just it's just hard to recover from that. Which is why someone like Chenna is so good because Chenna brings the fight to the defense. He's or to the offense. He sees what's coming. He slips that tackle. He jumps into the wrong gap because he knows this play is coming so he can get that TFL. You know, think he's, the game is slowed down. It slowed down last year for Boye. And I think it probably could slow, slow down again for D. Hall, too. Who's to say it can't? But that is why um, you haven't seen the impact because it's, it's really early downs for those guys. Because if you if you can succeed on early downs, let's say you can get those ops to be in the cheetah package on third down and then really get, go get paid, right, by getting to the quarterback. But – if the Seahawks have one of the worst run defenses because they can't stop the way down early down, then yeah, uh, it'll look like your edge group isn't really cooking like that because they're not. So that is really it. We, we look at the pass rushers when they get taken in the draft early, look at their sacks, look at the moves that they have. And that's, that's fine. We should do that. It's part of the eval, but it's early downs too. It really is early downs. If you can su- succeed on first and second, you'll just look like a far more impactful player. And that's why I'm a real big Cheddar guy. Because Chenna on every down can impact the game. Down by down by down. Every down he can do it. Uh, so that's the that's the step for those guys. And it's not even that the, the old staff didn't realize that. They just, the guys, like you said, guys weren't getting it done. So that's what the first thing Mike McDonald and his staff is going to want out of those guys. Like, hey, 
when we're doing our installs, first and second down, make plays. Make plays. And then when it comes to third down, go get paid. You know, make plays, go get paid. I think Clint used to say you got to earn the right to rush the passer. Right? Um, stop the run so you can have fun. You know, that's that's what they weren't doing. So it looked like nobody was having fun, but boy, hey. And then, like you said, that cooled down. So like that, that that's the issue. It's, it's early downs for, for all the edge rushers, but th- that's the way they're going to start to feel more impactful is they make plays on first and second down. D Panky 827, how high of a, of a percentage are you confident the Seahawks will receive at least one strong trade offer from a team to move up from pick 16? This is a good question. Um, would you say the name was again? I like the D Panky. Panky, I like that. Um, good question. I would put this at a pile like 85, 90%. I just feel like teams are going to want to be aggressive at a few spots. Like, this is really good for Seattle that this is a tackle class. And this is a receiver class because Seattle doesn't necessarily need either of those positions, but other teams will. And it'll be teams that, that had playoff success last year. Yep. Uh, you know, teams, teams are going to want a tackle. Teams are going to want to, Oh, Hey, this receiver's here. Let's jump up. You know um, how far they're willing to jump up. Who knows? Yeah. I think Buffalo has like a pick 28 or something. Do they want to jump up for a Stefan Diggs replacement? Who knows? At least it's on the table now, you know, <laughs> Arizona has picked 27. Let's say Arizona trades out of pick four, and then they take something other than a receiver with their first pick. Maybe at pick 27, they jump in there like, hey, I want one of those kids from Texas, whether it's Mitchell or the kid that broke the uh, 40-time record. Well, let's call Seattle. Let's move up to 16 from 27. The Packers need a tackle, I believe. Maybe they move up. Maybe they take, you know, uh, my man Troy from UW. They jump from 25. I don't think Dallas will come up. Uh, I don't know Howie Roseman's feeling on coming up. The Eagles have pick, I think, 22. Um, but I do, th- yes, I'm, I'm pretty calm. There's just so many possibilities. The chiefs could move up. I don't think they move up that far. Um, but yeah, green Bay, Arizona, Buffalo, I might even be missing a team in there. Uh, Maybe Pittsburgh the at 20. Too. The Texans, I don't think have their pick anymore. I think they gave it to, uh, Minnesota. Arizona. I think that's why Minnesota. Yeah. Or no, they Houston, ha- Arizona has picked 27 because of the Houston trade from last year's draft. Okay. Houston would have picked 23, I believe. Oh, no, no. Uh, yeah, I think they would have had picked 23 from another thing, but now that pick is Minnesota. And Minnesota, I think they're going to try to move up for a quarterback, so I'm not really considering them trading up to 16. But, yeah, I, I feel pretty confident in one of those teams that, like, if, if Schneider calls Green Bay and says, yo, give us pick, give us pick uh, 25, throw over 58 as well. We'll give you pick 118. We'll give you pick 16. Come on, let's do biz. And then I think they make something like that happen. Green Bay takes a tackle. You know, they get in front of some of these other teams that want tackles or receivers. I don't think Green Bay would do that for a receiver, but who knows? You know, Arizona, receiver needy. Buffalo, perhaps the most receiver needy team in the league right now, you know, <laughs> after after getting giving up digs and what they have behind digs. So, uh, yeah, I feel actually pretty confident. I'm pretty sure John's guys probably feel confident too. I like the way John's guys do this. I don't know if we talked about this on the show, but what John does is he has his guys like, you're in charge of a team. Like you're supposed to be the GM, like pretend you're the GM for that team. I don't know if he has guys do a whole division. I don't know how big their staff is, but let's say like if I'm the GM and I'm like, yo, Chris, I need you to be in charge of the NFC North. I need you to think like Quissy from Minnesota. Think like Goody from Green Bay. Think like Ryan Poles from whatever. And then Brad Holmes from Detroit. I need you to scout as if you work for those teams needs, areas of concern, cap space, so that when we're looking for teams to trade, we know, oh, ooh, there's tackles here. We know who we can call, who needs what's available, blah, blah, blah. Like, what would that? What would this team do in that situation? It's like, what would Jesus do? But, like, what would these other teams do? And he puts someone on his staff in charge of doing that for each team, or at least each division. I can't – I don't know how they break it up, but it doesn't matter. That's a good way of doing it because then you can kind of go through these scenarios where it's like, hey, hey, Steve in the back, do you think – Based on what the Cardinals need, would they do this, this, and that? What do the Cardinals need? Do they want this guy? What type of guys are they, you know? It, I like the, how they uh, break that up. I don't know if that's like the norm or whatever. I just like it. So, yeah, I think they can be pretty confident that whoever John has in charge of the Green Bay, Buffalo, Arizona, even Pittsburgh at 20, like whoever he has in charge of those teams, those guys should be probably feeling very confident that if they make that phone call on draft night, they'll be able to move back and collect some more picks. Next one is from Lance Zimmerman. Now that we have confirmation that John was responsible, largely responsible for roster construct, 
roster construction? Are there concerns that riding the ship might be a taller task than just replacing Pete Carroll? Yes, Lance. Yes. This is what I, I, feel, I feel like I've been trying to say this for so long. And I like John. I think he's a decent GM. But I'm not just going to excuse the bad things that, that they've done because Pete's gone. Pete was not the responsible guy for all the bad moves. He wasn't responsible for all the good moves. They worked together. Like, I, I think the reason why this came up this offseason, at least for me, is because someone, when they cut like Quandre and Jamal, someone was like applauding John of getting rid of all the bad contracts. I think I quote tweeted them and I was like, what the hell? He's getting rid of contracts he signed. He's not cleaning up another GM's mess. This is him. He he and Matt Thomas, their salary cap guy who does a lot of the negotiating. He's like their primary negotiator, honestly. From what I've heard, John like comes in for the big stuff. Uh, but like something as simple as signing like a one year deal with like like Artie Burns' deal. Like I don't know if John was like in on that, right? But generally speaking, it's it's Matt and it's John. They have the money, the budget, cap compliance, all of that. So if there's a contract you don't like, the trade you don't like, yes, the guy who did it is still here. Well, Matt Thomas is gone now. He just like quit like last week. But before last week, the guys were still here. So if you didn't like the Jamal Adams trade and compensation, if you didn't like the Luke Jokel deal, if you didn't like the Ziggy Ansah deal, if you didn't like the Eddie Lacy deal, if you didn't like the Jimmy the Jimmy Graham trade, if you didn't like the Percy trade and the six year contract they gave Percy, you know, like all of these things. If you didn't like this stuff, if you didn't like the Will Disley contract, if you never liked the Quandre contract, that that's these guys, same guys. Again, Matt just quit. But before Matt quit, same guys. Like, again, that's good and bad. If you liked the Bradley McDougal pickup, if you liked the Chenna contract, if you liked the Reek Woolen and Abe Lucas draft picks, same guy, same staff, right? So that's really important. So, yeah, it's going to take a while. That's honestly why I can't speak for Chris here, but I was pretty skeptical of them rebuilding this thing heading into the 2022 season because I was like, how often is it? that the people who necessitated the rebuild get to see the rebuild through mm. the reason they needed to rebuild after 2021 is because of the bad decisions that were made by Pete and John and their staff that was, they did bad things. They did moves that did not work. Like Gabe Jackson did not work. I'd like the process of that in real time. doesn't matter. Didn't work. Quentin Dunbar didn't work. Like these are, these are all Kerry Williams says his name, the corner. Yeah. That they, the Kerry yeah, Williams move was so bad. Players wanted him cut by like week one. They was going to Pete like, yo, we're dogs. He's not one. Get him out of yeah. here. They did the same thing with your boy Brandon Marshall. They was like, yo, Pete, we're dogs in this receiver room. You got rid of Jermaine, who is a dog, and you brought in Brandon Marshall, who's not a dog. People who brought in Brandon, still here. <laughs> like if you didn't like that move. Um, so I, it's, I'm using all these examples to just make the larger point that, yes, Lance, you're, you're correct in wondering, yo, hold on. We're just going to turn this around just because we fired Pete? Yeah, man, that's pretty ballsy. It's a pretty ballsy mm -hmm. assumption. It's just be like, hey, we're just going to get rid of Pete and fix this. Now, they're not the only team doing that. The Titans are doing that too. Hey, we're getting rid of Rabel and we're going to fix this. We're going to get rid of the guy who kept winning the division <laughs> and fix it. You know, um, We're going to get rid of Bill Belichick, greatest coach ever. We're going to hire Gerard Mayo and we're going to fix this stuff. You know, like There are teams doing it, and it's not to say that you can't. You can, but we need to, I guess, acknowledge how ballsy that is. Like Pete had some flaws, but he wasn't the problem here. He was working in tandem. He was part of the problem with the other guy. They was, they was a team. Like Pete did so much stuff that was like set the culture and the foundation of the team that made this successful. Uh, replacing that and being immediately successful is going to be tough. It's going to be tougher than I think people realize. You know, Pete wasn't like poisonous. You know what I mean? He wasn't like a Bill O'Brien where like everyone hated him and he was making stupid trades because he also controlled the roster. Like Bill O'Brien, it was very easy to see why getting rid of him was going to fix things eventually in Houston if you got the right guy. And even that took time, right? I think they fired like three coaches after that. So, yeah, Lance, you are correct. And I've been wanting to like, get that point across there too. This is going to take some – this might take some time because Pete was not just like poisonous – uh fruit on this tree like he was part of all, all of the good and the bad with the program holly drops in she wants to know how do you think the offensive line situation will pan out holly i'm a little worried i'm not gonna lie i don't lie because i've seen what a domino line looks like um i don't know how much you guys all watch other teams 
Uh, but I know me and Chris try to watch them when we can. Um, <laughs> We've seen it. And it, I'll tell you that. <laughs> the difference is just so obvious. Like, it's just so, like, not even just from Seattle to other teams, but, like, it doesn't take much to watch a team and be like, oh, their O-line is good. You usually probably can figure it out, like, two or three drives in. You're like, oh, this is it. Now, whether that sustains for the whole game is another thing. But, like, you can just kind of see it very early. Like, when you watch the Chiefs, for example, um, you can see that. Uh, when you watch the Dolphins, for example, you see the opposite. Um, when you watch the Ravens, you've seen a line that was, was pretty solid last year, actually. I don't know how because on paper it didn't look that great. But the game's not played on paper. Anyway, you can just you can just see it. The Rams last year, um, when I was actually re-watching some of the Rams Super Bowl run in 2018, the Jared Goff team and Marcus Peters, I said we not finished, and uh, the pass interference call against New Orleans, that team. And that team, that old line was so damn good. That's why when Todd Gurley went down, they put overweight C.J. Anderson in there. He was running all over people because it didn't matter who was playing running back. I could have put Chris in there and probably would have ran for like 50 yards against the Cowboys in the divisional round um, because their O-line was so damn dominant. Uh, so, yeah, I'm a little worried because I just don't see that on paper. I feel like for that to happen with this team, someone is going to have to make like a crazy jump. And not to say that it can't happen, but it would have to be like a – who made a really big, like a really big year, year two jump? I'm trying to think. Help me out here. Who, who made a really big one across the like, league? Wow. Like um, no, no, in Seattle, in Seattle. In we Seattle? That, like I, I'm talking no, like. I, I, um, well, go ahead. boy, boy is pretty close. I need to make it historic. Bigger. Yeah, uh, a bigger, bigger jump. Lovely. Okay. Um, who are we not okay. thinking of? Oh, I got, I got one. Um, what about Richardson? Ooh, Obviously, this was. Oh, the receiver. Oh, my gosh. The Seahawks didn't oh, P. bring Rich? P. Rich. Uh, not nah, bigger. So here's the example. Damn. I used. Cam, Cam Chancellor is the example. I used. Cam, like, played a little bit as a rookie. And then Cam and, like, and then was, like, a pro bowler year two. Like, he probably played about as many snaps on defense as, like, Olu played on offense last year. And then the next year he was he was, he was was locked in. Pro bowler. Uh I, th- I think he might have been original ballot Pro Bowler too. Maybe he got in as an alternate, but for the tense and purposes of this discussion, it doesn't matter. That's the type of jump I think you would need for it to be dominant. And or like if Anthony Bradford makes that jump, or like if Olu makes that jump, I think that is what you need. But if you just make like a Boye is probably a good example of like jumps we probably have seen before. Like a oh okay now he's like you know that even DK made that jump. Um, actually, DK is probably. A, a decent example of a good jump because he was like second team all pro in his second year. But the difference there, I would say, is his floor. Like we could see that in his rookie year. We we're like, oh, he's going to be something like this. Yeah, like we, we saw that very fast. Um, so, yeah, I think, yeah, Cam is probably the, maybe you guys can probably think of another one, but that's the example that comes to my mind where it's like a guy kind of played a little bit. There was some potential there. He was like a late round guy, so didn't get a ton of reps. And then by year two, it was like, oh, <laughs> we're good at this spot for years now. You know, he was, he is probably the best example, I think. And if you get like a, if Olu or Bradford makes one of those type of jumps, I, I think then you're in good shape. Otherwise I'm a little, I'm a little nervous here. I, I am. Next one comes from Chris Leeper at Rosebug underscore 22. Are you surprised? No X Ravens came to Seattle. I am. I am. And not just from the player standpoint. He didn't bring no coaches. No coaches. I mean, okay, this Josh, Josh Bynes, I think, is like the assistant linebackers coach. I think he's the position that KJ interviewed for. Uh, and I think this guy played for Mike McDonald for a couple of years, including last year. Uh, just retired in December, I believe. So he brought him. If you want to count that, I don't, I don't really – for the point of this discussion, we don't really need to. So basically – they said, all we need is Mike McDonald and we'll figure out the rest. That is, uh, that, that can work. I just feel like that we, I don't know how much precedent there is for that. I don't know the league history enough, well enough, but that feels pretty ballsy as well. No coaches here. And you, usually you just bring at least one of your homies with you, you know, like, the, like, like Dave Canales did, you know, he left and he brought like, he brought like a, I think the receivers coach, Brad, I uh, can't remember his name right now. Brad brought him. I think he's with him to Carolina now too. But then Dave called a bunch of people. I think Nate Carroll's over there. He grabbed a special teams coach over there. I think Izzo's over there. So to just to call net to bring none of your homies over, to not bring Geno Stone or Patrick Queen or 
nobody, man. Clowny, it just was like, nah, all we need is Mike McDonald. That's very, that's pretty rare for him to have no coaches from his previous job. And his coaching staff is not full of dudes that he just knows from other stops either. He's really just a Harbaugh guy, both Harbaugh brothers. And that's it. He just has worked for those two and just called guys he don't really know like that. Ryan Grubb, the D, the D line coach from the Cowboys, AD, the British cat. Like, this is all dudes he he just scoped out and was like, I think you're, you know, really good for this job and you're qualified and you're gonna help our team. So I'm gonna hire you, which is like maybe Mike McDonald should be in charge of like DEI for the world because he has mastered merit-based hiring. He just was like, I don't even care if I know you. You got the last name of someone on the building, black, white, whatever. Come on, <laughs> Come on in if I think you're good enough for the job. So maybe Mike McDonald should be president or something like that. But until that happens, he's the coach of the Seahawks, and he's got a tough task. Uh, so, yeah, I, I'm very surprised that he didn't bring anyone with him because it's just going to be so much stuff. I think I might have talked about this when he got hired, but one of the things that was really good about – I think this is really good about – the three coaches who succeeded in the NFC West in the last like decade, Pete, Kyle Shanahan, and Sean McVay, is they really knew who they were as coaches. And when you have that foundation and you have people around you that are like can help you reinforce it in times of like maybe that you, you may waver in that, it's really helpful. You know, um, I don't know if Mike has that. Maybe Leslie Frazier will help there. You know, I think he knows Leslie from some stop they had before. So I don't know. That's but yes, I, I'm surprised that. It's basically just Mike McDonald's like, I'm going to just find a bunch of dudes who I think are good at their jobs. Not a bunch of dudes yeah. I already know. Hawks fan 206, where does Jake Bobo fit in that wide receiver room? Well, wide receiver one, of course. You know? Uh, no, nah, I, I think uh, Jake is probably not going to have much of a big impact statistically because I feel like if Noah is like your – Noah fan is your fourth best pass catcher, Man, that's a pretty good room, and you need to get those other guys the ball too. Uh, it's going to be hard to get DK 100 targets. Tyler or Tyler 100 catches, DK 100 catches, JSN 75 catches. Get Noah to like 50. Man, that's a lot. Just not a lot of room for Jake, unfortunately. Um, but you know what, Jake's Jake's going to be good for this this thing. I think if something happens to somebody during the season, and it probably will, there's probably no chance that JSN, Tyler, and DK play all 17 games. That's just Football hurts too much for that. Um, so if one of those guys misses a game, you'll be fine. You you know, not to say Jake's as good as any of those three, but you'll be fine. I mean, look what happened when he had to play when DK missed the Arizona game. Jake hmm. stepped up. He was like, yo, I'm here. Third down, I'm here. You mean go over the middle and get smoked by a dude on the Bengals? I'm here. He got rocked on that play. Tell yeah, he did. Pop right back up. I was like, good. You know, he's, he's one of them white boys that don't feel pain. Uh, like, <laughs> <laughs> Baker Mayfield, one of them cats too, headbutting his teammates with no helmet on. It's insane. He's definitely one of those. Guys. Will Levis is one of those guys too. But yeah, Jake Jake's gonna have that type of role where he doesn't have a ton of volume. But if something happens, or you know, let's say DK gets hurt like in the middle of the game, or he has to poop again and gets carted to the locker room like he did in Detroit, uh, and they need Jake for a series or two, he's gonna make that clutch catch, whether it's a touchdown or a third down catch. That's gonna be Jake's. Role. And then special teams, obviously, but I don't see a ton of volume for Jake because there's, not, there's just not a ton of volume for wide receiver four on any team. I don't give mm. a damn who you are. Um, unless you're like the Packers, I feel like they just throw it to everybody. That dude, Wicks, Reed, Bo Melton, like it's like a different game. Uh, what's the other dude name? He didn't play a lot because he got hurt. Um, he's their best I receiver. Number wow. nine. He's number nine. Christian Watson. It's Christian That's Watson. his name, yeah. yes. Yeah, so between Wicks, Reed, Watson, Bo Melton, like they don't even have a wide receiver one, two, three, or four. They just, <laughs> they're just a unit. <laughs> yeah. Full on. Just like yeah, talk about meritocracy, I guess there too. So, uh, but the Seahawks don't have that. They have a pecking order and Jake just falls towards the bottom of it, but he's going to make some big plays. He's going to, he's going to impact the game at least a couple games. The, like the next couple of years, like at least one or two, you're going to be like, wow, the Seahawks really used Jake Bobo. Well, that game. All right. This one comes from Lukey Rex. Who do you predict will be the team's MVP? Make the biggest leap? Breakout season, sack leader, touchdown leader, rapid fire. Mike, I'm going to put you on the clock. You got one minute. Are you ready? Wait, you're not doing these two? I thought you were going to do it with me. I am. Well, we're going to do it separately. 
each get a minute, and you're going to roll off all those. Let me know when you're ready, okay. and I'll start the clock. Okay, I got my pen and paper here. Um, okay, yeah, I'm ready. All right, three, two, one, hit it. MVP. Geno Smith. Biggest leap. Mm, uh, JSN. Biggest, actually, breakout season, excuse me. Uh, breakout season, breakout season. Uh, I don't have a breakout. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I have Tyrell Dotson. Oh, damn it. That was mine. <laughs> Sack oh, leader. Okay. It's all good. Chenna. Easy. Touchdown leader. Okay. I was going to ask about this because it's clearly going to be Gino, but that's fine. Let's do skill positions. Not okay. name Gino yeah. Smith. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ken Walker. Fair. Okay. All right. Let's see if I can do this. Uh, MVP. I to a roll with Gino. Biggest leap. <sighs> this is where I had some fun. I will go ahead. Oh, God, I have two names. There's timers you know on here. I'm aware. Thank you. Go ahead and give okay. me. Oh, damn it. This is not as easy as I thought it would be. Screw it. I got big Hey, man, the timer is going here, man. Thank you, Mike. We're going to go ahead and say Julian Love. Okay. Breakout season. Go ahead and give me Boye Mafe. Sack leader, Boye Mafe. And touchdown leader, I will take DK. All right. Julian taking a leap. I like the Julian one because I do think he can take more of a leap than people think. Like the purple year is good, but like, there's a uh, what's the nicest way to say this before we move on to the next question? I'll put it this way there's a reason Julian was surprised he made the Pro Bowl. I'll put it that mm. way. That, that's probably the nicest, most fair way to say that. I say he didn't deserve it, but there's a reason that he was surprised. Um, so I do think he can make a leap next year. I'm right there with you. This one comes from at Ziggy, not nice. Which players from the Pete Carroll era do you feel should get their number retired? Yeah, number retirement can get a little tricky. Um, for the Seahawks, their franchise isn't that old. I think they're 1976 or 77 or something. So uh, right now, I think where they only have retired numbers of guys who made the hall. So let's go. With, so who's going to make the hall? From that old team. We got Earl. So you take 29. Earl should make the hall. If Earl doesn't make the hall, the hall is broken. Earl's one of the best safeties of ever. Uh, he, Marshawn Lynch. 24. So I'm a little, I'm not sure on Marshawn. Really? He's a tricky one for me. Yeah. He, he's I got a lot you, of but... touchdowns and a lot of yards. No, I, I think he's <laughs> worth it. I'm just like, if the voters are going to do no, that. No, I hear you. You're, um, you're giving both sides. Yeah. It's just. Would I vote him in? Yes. Do I think he'll get in? I don't know. Uh, but let's for for that. Let's say he gets in. So we got Marshawn, Earl, Bobby's a lock. So we're we're see this is a lot of numbers we're getting here. So we're retiring 54, 29. Sherm's in. Sherm, I think Sherm. Yeah. Yeah. Sherm Sherm's is, what number was he? Twenty five. There we go. Yeah. Um, He's like all these guys who made the all decade team. Like I pretty much think they're they're in. So like Earl was all decade. Sherm was all decade. I believe Bobby was even if Bobby wasn't all decade, I believe he was. Um, even if he wasn't, he he should be in uh as well. So he's a lock. Yeah, he was uh he was all 2010s. Yeah. And I think the all 2010 of these all decade teams are voted on by if not all of the same people from the hall, a lot of the same people. So that's why I think that that matters a lot. Marshawn was not all decade, I don't believe, and neither was Cam. So Cam is another interesting one. And then our other one that's interesting is Russ. Are we putting Russ in the Hall yes. of Fame? Oh, yeah, putting Russ in the Hall because I, I we're, I'm bringing it in the context of the Hall because I believe that right now all the retired numbers for the Seahawks are people who made the Hall, with the exception of uh, the number twelve. Damn, that's tough. So, I would say did Russ do enough? I can't, I can't put him in the Hall. No, he's really, really talented, great quarter, really good quarterback, Hall of Fame though. I think he just falls short. He'd have yeah, to, so the retired to numbers are – sorry to cut you off. I want to just read it off real quick. 45, 71, 80, and 96. So, yeah, all Hall of Famers. So Yeah, I can't – Pretty much you got to make the Hall to get retired in Seattle. 
it'll just be 25, 29, maybe 24, maybe. But okay, yeah, yeah I see, put... I was going to ask that. If you, if you, I feel like if you put Marshawn in, you have to put Russ in. Russ's really? career is just as, yeah, it's a nine-time Pro Bowler. I, mean, just, I think Marshawn made it like four. Now, Pro Bowls aren't everything, but like I think Marshawn only made it like four times or something. Like, Mar- Marshawn, I think, have... has a couple all pros, which I don't think Russ has any of those first teams. So there's that. Yeah, Marshawn made the Pro Bowl five times. Uh, and he was uh, all pro. One. Oh, Marshawn was on the all decade team. Oh, yeah. Okay. Never mind. I think Marshawn's in. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah, I'm... <laughs> I didn't, I forgot Marshawn made the all decade team as well. That's fine. You, you saw it right then and there. So, so I know 24. Cam did not make it. So I, I, I'm skeptical on Cam. Cam's also never been all pro. So, we got 29, 25, 54, that's unfortunate, 24, that's safety. and three. Think about those safeties that had to go up against, too. That's yeah. tough. I mean, uh, I don't think it's that tough. Like, he, I think a couple of those years he lost out to Eric Berry, which is like, okay, that's fine. But then, like, yeah, I Eric think a couple was, of those yeah. years it was like Eric Weddle. It was just like, hmm, if he wasn't, like, clearly better than Eric Weddle, are you a Hall of Famer? And, and now Eric Quiddle was really good. Uh, really, no, he was. Really good, actually. Um, like, I don't want to dismiss that. But, like, I feel like it's a good – that's a good way to view Cam's thing. It's like, hmm, was Cam better than Eric Quiddle? Well, no. Maybe. Maybe not. So, 3, 29, better 25. Uh, yeah, no one's a better hitter than Cam of his era. Maybe Dante uh, Whitner from the Niners. Uh, oh, 29, God, 25, 54, 24, 3. Here we go. Is our retired. Oh, you're putting Russ in? Yeah, yeah. I'll put Russ, I'll put Russ in. <laughs> it's tough. Okay, fair enough. Russ has uh, only had one bad season. No, I hear Think you. Think about that. He's played 12 years, one bad year. Now, I'd say all the other years were good. Like, last year wasn't good, <laughs> but he's Better only had from one what he bad got... <laughs> No, I hear you. It's yeah. a, it's definitely an interesting discussion. We don't have to do it now on this show because that would be another hour discussion about why Russ is or isn't. But yeah, I hear you. Let's see. This one's from Alec. If you could add a single pass Seahawk prime, that is, to the Seahawks team, who would you choose and why? It's Earl Thomas. It's Earl Thomas with that. I really think as I've been watching old like Earl's like one of the best football players I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> this dude is like, insanely good. Like Every year, Earl was like one of the best in the league. Every year, he didn't break his leg. Like the only time he ever didn't like get the accolades at the end of the year because he broke his leg. Broke his leg in 2016. Broke his leg in 2018. In 2018, before he broke his leg, he had three picks in like three games. Like he was just, and that was with no training camp, no preseason because he was holding out. He just came up off the couch, <laughs> hawking. You know, like he he was, and that was in year like nine. Like baller. Um, yeah, no, Earl Earl makes your defense go. He really does. I was talking to some coaches from that era, like last week, and there's a bunch of reasons why when those other coaches got hired away from Seattle, they couldn't make this thing work. But like reason number one is they didn't have Earl. And I was like, why didn't the Dan Quinn thing immediately pop in Atlanta? Yeah, because he didn't bring Earl with him. He brought Earl with him. That thing could have worked. He unlocked everything. It's like most defenses are like, ooh, it starts up front. That's that's cool. It started with number 29, and it worked the other way. So, yeah, uh, you put Earl on any of these Seahawk teams. I'm not even joking. You put Earl on any of the Seahawk teams from, like, the past four years, and they're probably a top 10 defense. Like, as bad as, like, the 2022 defense was, for example, you put Earl on there. Um, now, I guess I'd have to ask if you're – Swapping him for Quandre and putting him next to Quandre. But, like, if you're putting him next to Quandre, top 10 defense. I think Earl was that transformative as a as a player. Easy, 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 easy one for me. You know, I'll, I'll go Steve Hutchinson, man. I think that's just... Fair. That's fair. Talk about setting the old line. <laughs> hey! <Ooh. laughs> you got Steve Boy. Hutch in the locker room. I think things are a little better. Not that Aaron Donald's unretired, but... Steve Hutchinson versus Aaron, Aaron. I like the chances here. You give a little mm-hmm, chip, I think it'll work out. So I think we both did a really good job of prioritizing a specific need, which is definitely, you know, Earl would definitely change things in the safety, and Steve Hutch on the offensive line would 
transform things tremendously. So that's who I will go with. I think the run game, pass protector, my goodness. Yeah, I got no, Hutch, Hutch, Hutch is a good pick. I got to Hutch, see Steve Hutch. do it too. It's not as if, you know, I'm, I'm picking Kenny easily. I, I haven't seen Kenny play, so <laughs> <laughs> as crazy as no that sounds. To, no shade to Kenny, but yeah, he played no, before I he just, was born, yeah. Yeah, I just didn't feel like going that far back. Like, oh, I'll just take Kenny easily, and I've never seen him play, so I, I didn't feel that would be fair. So someone that I have seen play and was dominant, give me. Yeah, no, that's 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 fair. Yeah, no, they. I think they both they both would make their respective sides of the ball top ten immediately. <laughs> they're they're a top ten offense with with Hutch today. Oh yeah, like prime Hutch, and they're a top ten defense. I think with even with the other talent holes on defense, I think you put Earl in there, and it just changes everything, dog. Everything. Mike, you're well connected. This is from Turns Forty Four. What's your feel on how this team is different? That's a good question. Um, I'm not sure, but because I haven't, I haven't actually really been around. I, I met Mike McDonald um, in Orlando. I didn't get to. I got a little bit of a sense of a sense of humor. Did I tell this little quick story? Did I tell my Orlando Mike McDonald story? I don't think no. you have. No. Okay. It's just real quick. So I met him at the bar. I think the first night I got to Orlando. Just small talk, like, hey, you know, I'm I'm Mike. You're Mike. You're probably going to remember my name because it's the best one out there. And it's like, oh, yeah, okay, cool. Uh, and then so the next day, I run into him and his wife. And uh, this was before, you know how the coaches do like a breakfast out there, which is why we're there. Uh, this is the night before the breakfast. And he's like, he's like, uh, yeah, man, you know, tomorrow morning, you know, just like for like 30 minutes, just just me and you, we're going to do an exclusive. I said, where? That's what's up, Mike. I really appreciate that. He was like, no, nah, I'm just messing with you. I was like, oh, my God. That was mean. <laughs> I don't know how you can get that him was, back, but my goodness, Mike, that was great. That was so he was, he was he was messing with me. It was funny. We laughed at it, but like I wasn't alone. There was like like three of my reporter friends there, his wife, like somebody else was there too. So it was like everyone's seen me get excited. <laughs> just, <laughs> and then just the letdown. <laughs> it was a oh, it was a quick letdown. Um, but yeah, he's like there's a little little snapshot into his sense of humor. It's a funny, funny guy. Um, the one thing that I'm going to be curious on how he handles. So Pete Carroll really was really, really positive. And he was positive at a time where there was still a lot of old school ball coaches. Like when Pete showed up in 2010, it was still like, you know, p- people were, if you had a head coach, his mentor was probably like a really old school ball coach who was used to like two a days and like you drop a pass, you know, Denzel you Washington, you run a mile type swag. <laughs> Pete wasn't that. Pete didn't rule with the like fear. Pete's thing wasn't if you don't perform well, I'm gonna cut you. You know, like with Earl, I mentioned he was gonna get you know benched. It wasn't like Earl, man, you gotta get out of here, man. You suck. You can't make these tackles. You can't make these plays. Like he didn't tear guys down. His thing was ruling with positivity. His was like, guys, you you can make these plays. I've seen you make these plays in practice. Just be you. Don't do, don't try to be anything other than what we've seen you be in practice. What we've seen you do what you're capable of. Like he ruled with positivity in that way. Um, and that was at the time considered revolutionary, not revolutionary. That's too strong, but you guys know what I mean? It stood out, but y'all in the playing rap music and the basketball hoop in the meeting room. Like that was Pete's coaching style players coach for real. If you dropped a pass, it was like, yo, I know you can make that catch. Go make that catch. Not what are you doing? You dropping my football. And that was huge. That's huge. And it really helped out. It helped guys be the best version of themselves, help keep them confident in times of turmoil. I don't know if that's Mike McDonald's coach style. I don't really know how he is. I'm not saying he's one way or the other. I just genuinely don't know. And I, and I feel like now you almost have to coach that way because of the way these kids are. I'm, and now I'm sounding old, but you guys know what I mean. Like this is just a different era of football player. They're not used to, They're not getting chewed out in the ways that guys were getting chewed out in the 80s, 90s, or even early 2000s where coaches were so used to ruling with fear. These kids are coming in with money, with you know these NIL kids. You now they're coming in with power. You know they're coming in with a little bit more entitlement, and and also they're just grown men too. But there's all these other factors that you can't just. I don't think you can really be old school in that way. We've seen kind of how guys like Matt Patricia don't work. It sounds like Eric Bieniemy coaches that way, where it's not like Pete had that positive feel to him that really helped with that generation of player. And that was before you like, now I think every player is like that where you need them not coddle them, but you know what I mean? There's a word that I got to use. I don't really know what the word I'm looking for is, but you just got to coach these kids different. And Pete saw that early. Cause that's just how he is. 
But is Mike McDonald that way? Because I do feel like that's really important with coaching guys today is that that positivity, like not tearing them down, not trying to rule with the fear of getting these guys out of here. Because the reality is you're not going to get them out of here. If DK Metcalf drops some passes, you're not about to cut them. You're not. So you can't you can't coach him that way because he makes twenty four million dollars. He makes more than you <laughs> mm. the coach. You just can't do that. Uh, you know, you just can't. So it's not like back in the day when they wasn't making no bread, you know, at least like 80s, 70s, stuff like that. So I'm very curious how Mike McDonald handles that, because it feels like you almost have to coach the way Pete was doing it before. Um, and if that's not naturally him, you know, who do, I honestly genuinely don't know. All I know is he's a real jerk with that joke that he made to me. So I really know <laughs> about him. <laughs> that hurts so bad. I wish you guys could see my face for like three seconds. I was like, oh, my God, I'm about to get an exclusive with the head coach. This is great. And then nothing. I didn't get the exclusive. So Thank coming you. soon, yeah. though. Oh, yeah. Now I'm but every time I see him now, I'm like, yo, so with that exclusive. Yo, every <laughs> time I see him. Now, say, let's do it, Mike. <laughs> and then that's gonna be the day. Make sure we do it on the show, too. Perfect. Next one we got is from Chuck Warner. I don't know if this has ever been covered, but I'm curious. Rumors about Pete saying he would step down and then maybe midseason decide to change his mind and competed like hell to stay. Is that accurate? And then also, part two, did John Schneider Bill was trying to move on, or was he trying to keep Pete? I think if he was trying to keep Pete, Pete would be here. Um, because Jody's not a football person, so if she was gonna defer to a football person, like if John was like, Oh, yeah, yeah, no, nah, man, Pete got it. I feel like I feel like Pete would be here. That's not anything anyone told me, but just she just she Jody is just not a football person like that. So it's not like she's gonna just tell John, just shut up. I'm getting the old man out of here. No, I feel like if John was like, yo, we just gotta do this and that, unless there was something like they needed Pete to like fire certain assistants or something and Pete just didn't want to do it, then it's like, all right, you got to go. You're willing to die on this hill to protect so-and-so? You guys can go together. Maybe a situation like that. Um, I don't know about Pete being willing to step down during the season because of kind of what I just talked about, but at least as it pertains to his own mind. Pete always feels like something good is going to happen. He always does. So I can't – even when they lost, what, four or five straight there, um, Pete would have felt like they were going to win the next one. And then the next one – and then the next one, that's just kind of how he's wired to, to feel like you're about to step down assumes that you're not about to succeed because in Pete's mind, once you get in the playoffs, everybody is zero, zero. And then he feel like they're going to win the first game and then the next game and then the next game. So I, it would be hard for me to, for me to imagine that Pete would even let his brain think something like that, let alone tell someone else he's thinking like that and then make a promise based on that, that he's about to walk away from his job. Not to say that that didn't happen. I just haven't heard that. Um, but just kind of knowing how Pete's brain is wired, I mean, he has seen it. He's seen his team just rattle off these wins. The 2015 team, when guys weren't talking to each other and Cam was holding out and they had just lost the Super Bowl in the one, they just rattled off a bunch of wins and made the division around again. You know, uh, the, the Super Bowl year they lost, like that Kansas City game was ugly. You know, coaches arguing with each other on the headsets, guys beefing. Um, and then they didn't lose a game after that. And hmm. won the division again and got home field in the playoffs again. Uh, so, yeah, I, I just don't see – maybe that happened, but just reading what I know about Pete, that would be tough for me to envision. Got a few more, Mike. This is from KC Masterman. Name the Seahawks player or two that most deserves a statue outside Century Link. That's a good one. I, I think Pete for sure. I think it would be very tough, and I actually was thinking about this uh, rewatching the playoff game that Cam had the pick six on Cam. Uh, it would be so tough to pick a pick one guy, but I think if you were going to do it, you give them to Sherm and Marshawn would be my, be my guess. They're not the best guys from that era, but like, I do think what defined that era. It's, Cause the question was that era, right? Or was it like all time? I got to think about that. I'm, I think it was all time, Mike. All uh, time. That's different. That's a little different. Um, because that you could probably make a justification for like Big Walt or Cortez. Yeah, uh, that's what I had Big Walt. That would be mine. Yeah. If okay, if you do, yes, if you go, yeah, that, that's fair. If you go, big but I'm, picture, but also I'm that. not. I think Richard Sherman should be in that conversation without a question. Yeah, and and I and I think when you talk about like a statue, you need like the a tip. moment. <laughs> yeah, you need a moment to immortalize, right? So yeah. You get Marshawn holding his holding his nuts, you know, jumping in off the beast quake, and then you get, yeah, yeah, it's a, 
iconic. Like if you're going to immortalize a moment, you need to have like a moment worth doing that. So um, those other guys don't really with Cam, I guess you could do his like hammer celebration like that would, you know, so, but I wouldn't do a ca statue of Cam. And then um, Bobby doesn't really have like one thing uh, even because I think Bobby's probably one of the best players, if not the best player in franchise history. But like the attitude that Sherman and, and Marshawn had when I talked about how like Earl's play style unlocked things, I think their their attitudes unlock things. Mm. Like, I really Sherm was just so boastful, so he just gave the city so much swagger, and he made he was like a front runner because Seattle is not a front runner city, it's not a bunch of city with a bunch of pro sports championships, and Sherm was just a badass. You know what I'm saying? Like he is different. So. And he gave him that swag. And then Marshawn just gave him that swag on the other side of the ball, which was just – he honestly, Marshawn might be the coolest football player ever. He honestly might be. Like, it, it, in terms I don't know. Of just, just I don't know. I'll argue, I'll argue my guy Chad Johnson's right there with him. I would say it's probably Dion. Um, but, like – Oh, I forgot after about De that. Look at that. Yeah, De Dion is, like, probably the unquestionably number one. But if you wanted to make an argument for somebody else, yeah, I would say probably a Chad, T.O., um, and Marshawn are, like, on, like, the tier two of guys – there's probably other guys on tier two, but like those guys on Marshawn is just so he, he's just got the sauce, man. He he's him. He really <laughs> does. Yeah, no, nah, he he's he's a cool, and he's not like it's not just like he's super popular too. Like he's actually a cool dude. Like Odell Beckham was like cool, and like the guys like in the way that like ladies would love Odell, but then he'll do some stuff on the field or like post something on online. I'm <laughs> like, eh, you got weird. <laughs> Whereas like Marshawn is like an actual cool cat all around. Um, yeah, I, those would probably be, those would probably be like tier two. You can put Shannon Sharp on tier two if you want, but he's more funny, I guess. Um, <laughs> a big goofball. Yeah. I guess we don't got to do the whole list, but yeah, I think if you, on the non Dion tier, yeah, put Marshawn in there. Last one comes from tough guy football. All right. Let's hear some thoughts on this silly K dot Drake J Cole beef. Why? And then to close it out, who is the most petty Seahawks player of all time? The most petty Seahawks player of all time is Sherm. And I think Sherm, uh, as it connects to like a rap beef, Sherm was like in rap beefs for this project I'm working on. I actually revisited all the beefs he had. I had like, I rewatched the, the thing with Skip Bayless. I rewatched or revisited all the stuff he said about Crabtree. Uh, I forgot he called out Roddy White. <laughs> I forgot that. Wow. I he called out everybody. Yeah. yeah. Well, the Roddy White one was funny because he was just like, so you know how they do those top 100 things. Um, mm -hmm. And usually the players on there are being complimentary of the player being put in the top 100. It's like, oh, he's really good. Got good hands. He's strong or whatever. They have all these cool little anecdotes. And Sherm was just like, Roddy White, top 100. No. <laughs> Why is he on the list? <laughs> I don't and think he dead, should be. Dead ass. <laughs> he was like, I don't think Roddy is a top 100 player. I've never seen anything like that with someone on the top 100. It says a dude doesn't belong on the top 100. He was like, Roddy White, why would you put him on here? <laughs> That's crazy. Wow. Roddy, Roddy at the time had made like the last like four Pro Bowls or something too. Like it was, it was so very clear that Roddy was a top 100 player. And his term was just like, I don't think he belongs on here. Mm. <laughs> and I felt that were so petty. petty for running that too. They didn't have to put that. In. That's another thing. Yeah. Because I'm pretty sure there's probably some negative comments that are made by the players, but it's at the discretion of the editors and the producers on what actually makes the show. And someone was like, we're going to put this on the Roddy segment. Uh, and that was that's that was actually unfair to Roddy because no one else gets torn down on their segment. But yeah, Sherman was just like, Roddy, wait, <laughs> top 100? <laughs> Not to me. No, <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, so, yes, he is. He, it's, it's, it's definitely it's definitely Sherm. And it, I bring up Sherm also because Sherm has moments and that's what the difference between like someone like Kendrick Lamar and like a rap beef, he creates moments like that. It's he's F the big three. It's just big me. Like that's a moment. It's not even, that's not a bar. That's not creative. It's not even that mean, but it's a moment. You go to the club right now and they play that song. The beat drops and everybody's like, it's just big me. You know what I'm saying? Nobody's doing yeah. no J Cole line. Sherm created the same stuff where if someone else was just as good a trash talker, Sherman went on national television and so, told Skip Bayless, I'm better at life than you. <laughs> That's a heater. That's a heater. Just one line. I'm better than you at life, Skip. Like, like that's crazy. Um, same thing. Like, don't you ever talk about the best 
ever tried me with a sorry receiver like Crabtree? What? Like, that's a moment. Sherman was able to create those moments. Even the you mad bro thing with Brady, um, he was able to create those moments. Uh, and I think that's, I don't know why Kendrick and all those guys are beefing, but I think if you are going to beef with somebody and it has to do with words, like if y'all are not actually going to throw hands, you the goal should be to create moments that really sting. Like Crabtree has to see that clip for the rest of his life. His kids are going to have to see that. Because it's it's one of the most famous clips in NFL history. Don't you ever Crabtree? Don't you ever t- don't you ever talk about the best? His kids are gonna have to see that forever, <laughs> right? <laughs> Whether Crabtree was good or not, if Crabtree could have been the best receiver of all time, doesn't matter. That clip lives moment. forever. <laughs> yeah, Roddy White could be a top one hundred player of all time. Doesn't matter because that clip is there. Skip could be the best sports media person of all time, and he's arguably one of the most influential and most famous. Doesn't matter because Sherm, that clip lives forever. He said, I'm better than you at life. Mm. That at life. That's why Sherm is the most most he's probably the most brilliant too. Uh in, in that regard. Like, yeah, that was that's just that's special stuff, man. He's Roddy White. <laughs> What's he doing in here? <laughs> that is so cold, man. But look, I gotta gonna, find that clip, dog. Oh my I kind of want to throw it in here, but at the same time, I want everyone to go look it up on their own time because I think that's that's Sherman for you, man. Sherman is one of a kind. He's witty, brilliant. He says, I feel like all the wrong things at the right time. <laughs> Dog, that he, was he's just so, so he's he's honest. He's he never holds his tongue. I can only imagine the things he would say to just random people. Like if you try to disrespect Sherman, like how that conversation would end and how he would just embarrass you. Because now you're wondering why that he, I I've seen on multiple occasions him destroy people, live television. He's done it. So why would I think I can come out here and have a war of words with Richard Sherman and think oh, you're going to walk out of there unscathed. Yeah, man. I actually, I, ha- I don't have the clip, but I have the link to it. It's so funny. Maybe we could put the link in there or something like that in the bio. It's just so funny, man. It's just, I forgot all about that. It's Roddy White, top 100. Uh, and even then, that was after, we can end the show after this, sorry, but this is after Roddy had caught that touchdown on Sherman in the playoffs. This mm. aired after that. Now Sherm said it before that, and then yeah. it got you know it airs in July. But he said it, and it aired after that. Um, <laughs> and even then, they asked Sherm about that later, I think. And then he was like, "Man, that, that was that was Cam's fault." <laughs> he <laughs> didn't say it. He didn't say it explicitly, but he was just like, "I'm not gonna throw my teammate under the bus." But if you watch film, you can see that why that play happened. And then I went back and found it, and yeah, Cam bit on a pump fake, and that's why. Um, that's why Roddy ends up just getting open. But yeah, man, that was just uh yeah, put a statue of Sherm there, man. Like the tip should definitely be immortalized in front of Seattle Stadium. Like that's iconic. The, the great the greatest play in franchise history, for sure. Can't make it up. But look, it's been another episode of Seahawks Man to Man. We think thank each and every one of you for taking the time to listen, watch our show. We appreciate all the love and support. We will be back with another draft special. We have someone going to get into the bolts and weeds of what position, Mike? Actually, just a whole look at the draft. Yeah, we're going to do a whole draft in this next one, yeah. So it'll be really fun. We're looking forward to doing it and bringing it to you guys. We want to thank you again. Mike, is there anything else you want to add before we shake? Appreciate the love and support, y'all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hit that subscribe button on YouTube. We'll catch you next time. Peace.